We have here today um, members of our Vision Forward Committee, and we have some students. We have some other people from our community who came just for today. Uh, and you know we have uh, Greg Bear here, uh, a long time and famous science fiction writer. We have some board members here. So uh, I hope through the morning we get to uh, mingle and uh, talk to one another. I would like to talk to you about what our committee is doing. I'm Bill Nestor, I'm the superintendent. We formed a planning committee in the fall to talk about what we ought to be planning for education uh, 20 years out. Our orientation, I, I want anyone that's not on our committee to know, has been not to be prepared for the future, but rather to envision future possibilities so that we can create preferred futures for education in the Snohomish community. A theme we have chosen is how we can create a smarter, more connected community, and a subsidiary of that is how technology can support us in getting there. So our quest is to really create scenarios for the future and to, through our conversations and thought, to envision what's preferred and see what strategies we can put in place to create a preferred future for our educational system and our community. You know as well as I do that education is not bound by the four walls of the classroom or the perimeters of the building. Um, so we need, in our group, to be thinking about education on a much greater scale than that. So having said that, our purpose here today is to have someone come in and kind of shape the foundations of our thinking. We told our community when we first met that in order to think uh, in a novel way about the future, we have to challenge our current deeply held assumptions about what education is. Um, we know, for instance, the kids, students, don't live in the same world we do. We may think they live in our world, but they really don't. They're in a very different world. If we can break loose of some of those embedded assumptions we have about what the future is, then we can truly engage in a creative process of designing something better um, for both our community and our students. So we said that the first thing we have to do is get people in who can be disruptors to our thinking. And we talked to our committee that these people that come in and talk to us may get us very uncomfortable because this is not how we see things. And so the challenge we've taken on is to allow ourselves to become vulnerable to radically different possibilities. Now those things may not be as radically different for uh, students. They may already be there. So in that sense, what we're saying is that we want um, the people that are coming in to talk to us to really shape the foundations of our thinking. And out of that, we believe we'll be able to craft a very rich, connected um, community uh, in the future. So having said that, uh, someone's going to introduce Greg Bear and talk to us about how we're going to work today. I do want to thank you all for coming. We'll keep this to 12 o'clock and be on our way. It's wonderful to have this many people here. Thank you, Bill. I'm Matt King, and I'm a longtime teacher in the Snowbridge School District, and I taught science fiction for a long time, and, and now I'm working in the, the district office here teaching and learning. Um, and as Bill said, I mean, we were looking for provocateurs. People who could come in and disrupt our thinking, challenge kind of some of our views of things, and, and of course, uh, you know, my mind goes to science fiction authors. Um, and Greg Bear came to mind very quickly because he is someone who's local. Um, if you've read some of his work, uh, Darwin's Radio, Snohomish is a setting in town, um, and so he is someone who is familiar with uh, with our town. But he is also somebody that that I've come to appreciate on, on a level in terms of his thinking about how change happens and changing a little bit of the genre of science fiction. 
I think he is one of the first writers to really look at the idea of biology, who we are deeply, in a manner of just like, instead of looking at the, the hard sciences of physics and so forth and chemistry, it's just like what's out there and what's our world about. It's like, who are we? What are we going to become? And as Bill said, trying to think about, you know, where are we going? What are our schools going to look like? What is our community going to look like? That have someone like Greg come in and talk to us just about his ideas about the future um, could give us a pathway for maybe thinking about some things we haven't considered. And so, um, you know, there's there's a lot about Greg that you can read about on his um, his webpage, gregbear.com. He has a great biography um, that just details so many little things here. And I just put up a couple things here and a couple of his books, but some places that he has done consulting. Um, he has, you know, definitely made a contribution well beyond his wonderful science fiction in terms of us uh, different agencies and government um, uh, places uh, wanting his expertise. And he's not here as a consultant. He's here to have us think about things. And this quote here is kind of a misnomer about science fiction that science fiction is about anything other than people. It's about people doing stuff, sometimes doing extraordinary stuff. And I think that that is exactly what we want, is to be able to do extraordinary things for our community and our students. And so with that, Greg Bear, it's all yours. And we, we had kind of a format. We'll see how it works here. But Greg's going to start out by talking to you, and then we'll see how you talk to him. <laughs> oh, that, or what oh, you got that? Is that good? OK. I want to break the ice here a little bit. All this stuff is kind of, uh, it's OK. But I want to tell you that I'm really here because I'm one of the early founders of Comic-Con in San Diego. So. And believe me, that gets you a lot more cups of coffee than some of this stuff in Washington, D.C., if you go back down to San Diego. So a little bit about my background is I was a curious kid who really loved anything having to do with imagination back in a day when hardly anybody knew what warp drive meant. You know, this is the early days of Star Trek. I'm in high school. You've got Lost in Space fun, but not profound. You've got 2001 coming up. We were hungering for when 2001, the movie, would arrive. I waited four years for it. We had Star Trek suddenly, and that knocked us all for a loop because I had a hard time drawing the spaceship. You know, we we're starting to get really strange spaceships, not just flying saucers and rocket ships. Instead, we get this, this future that seems to have its own comprehensive point of view. So in high school, I'm talking to my teachers, and I'm realizing, OK, what are we going to do here? How, how am I going to fit into this community when no one understands what the hell I'm talking about? There were a few teachers who did, and blessings upon them. When I got into college, it was the same thing. You had old battles being fought, old cultural battles. And I, I slowly came to realize that teachers have as difficult a career as politicians because there are so many expectations laid upon them that the teacher has to anticipate where the next assault is going to come from. The next assault is, you can't teach my kids that. That's wrong. And we all have opinions about what is right or wrong. So you're all on the front lines, students and teachers, of this cultural war, which means that to really be savvy, a teacher has to be a kind of an anthropologist like Jane Goodall, wandering through these tribes of curious apes. You know, and trying to figure out what they really mean, what they really want, are they really angry, or are they just sort of you know, perpetually pissed off because life isn't what they want? How do you teach their kids? How do you get their kids to expand a little bit beyond what the parents are doing, which the parents do not want the kids to do? But you've got to inform them, yes, if your kids aren't better than you, you failed, and that sort of thing. And you know, back and forth, and men, you know, forget lawyers and police officers, teachers are where the TV show should be. And there have been some good TV shows about teachers, but not the real stuff where you have to deal with the political situations and go to the school board meetings and fight the good fight. And many, many years ago, it's been about 18 or 19 years ago now, Muckleteal School District, not directly connected with you guys, I know, Muckleteal School District had a, had a dispute going on between parents and teachers about the teaching of a book in the schools. How familiar is that? And what, the, what one group of parents decided they didn't want taught in the schools was Ray Bradbury's Martian Chronicles. And they thought they had prepared a political assailant on this that was insurmountable. He uses the word hell in this book. We don't want our kids using the word hell. He also uses the N-word, which, as we all know, watching HBO or Django and Chains is pretty much everywhere now. He uses, but he, he's, 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 he's profane and he's racist, and this book is a profane, racist book. 
and that was so completely off my experience of having read the book. The teachers prepared for this. I went in and advised a little bit uh, and, and attended the meeting where they hashed this out with the school board, and it was dicey. The school board came down five to four in favor of keeping the book. But the whole uh, 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 publicity drive from the schools, the teachers, the newspapers was so powerful that the woman, the poor woman who started this whole campaign and straw bossed it, got up and apologized afterwards. She says, I didn't realize how passionate people were about this. And she learned a real lesson, which was there is a committed um, approach among teachers and even among most parents to the future. And among school board members, there's a commitment to realize that no, we cannot shut down because of controversy what our kids are seeing or reading. But back in 1968 when I'm graduating from high school, most of this stuff is, is just the province of a very small select community. We thought it was small. But it turned out to have a lot of scientists, a lot of teachers, a lot of politicians even, a lot of rock stars, a lot of jazz musicians. They all loved this. Science fiction, the art of imagination, was the jazz of literature. And the fact that it wasn't respected was even better. Because, my God, we're oppressed. How cool is that? We're actually oppressed. What are we going to do about this? Well, we're going to start Comic-Con. You know, we're going, to get, we're going to go to science fiction conventions all over the country and meet writers. We're actually going to hang out with writers and talk and sit on panels. And at a science fiction convention, these panels are like panels at an academic conference, only there's nobody grading you. Okay, there's no one. It's just a free-for-all. And some of the topics that I've encountered in panels at science fiction conventions and Comic-Cons and all the other places where these weird people gather was just mind-blowing. You could go to an academic conference and get one-tenth the power and the energy of these wild-ass people out there just saying whatever they thought and, in some cases, really hitting the mark. So as the years went by, I realized that there's a tremendous resource in the career, in the interface between science and literature. There's this huge interaction which could be really useful for education. I was a TA, a teacher's assistant, at my high school in San Diego, Crawford High School. Uh, about a year after I got out of school, I came back as a chemistry TA and then I came back as an art TA. And that's kind of been the story of my life, is uh, to go in and, 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 and get that shell pink titration solution in the chemistry class, which impressed my former chemistry teacher immensely. I got a better grade as a TA than I did as a student. You know, all, and then to go in into the art class and be assigned to the squirrely class, so the kids that really didn't fit in. So the kids that just had a hard time in school in general, and to talk to them and find out, well, what is it that you like? Because I had a really good teacher in this regard, a man named Ray Bradbury, who I met and read when I was a young teenager, but met when I was 16 and was friends with until he died just recently. And I would go to his lectures in Southern California and listen to him talk, and what he said was, you have to pay attention to what you love. You can't have people tell you that you can't be passionate about things. The whole world wants to squash you down when you're enthusiastic. The whole world wants you to be, to tow their mark, not to go off in a different direction. So if we look at Fahrenheit 451, one of the opening lines is, if they give you ruled paper, write the other way. And that was a combination of things that kind of shaped my entire life. One, do what you love, acknowledge what you love, and don't always do what the other people tell you to do. Write the other way. And boy, I did that, and they got me into trouble. You know, I flunked a couple of classes in college because I didn't really get it. You know, a class in metaphysics wasn't really about metaphysics, it was about Aristotle. What's that about? That sort of thing. So nowadays, when we're trying to be radical as politicians and teachers, we have to be actually more understanding and anthropological, which is you're coming into a community that has its own organic structure. Politics is biology. Don't listen to biologists, biologists or politicians tell you otherwise. Life is the same from top to bottom in terms of its patterns, its organizations, and its personalities. The greatest asset you have in trying to figure out as an anthropologist what is going on is not your academic training, it's your instinct for understanding people and characters around you. The same thing is true about technology, how people use technology, what it's going to be like, what the future will be like. Look at your tribe. Look at your community. John Dewey, great educational philosopher, says all things come clothed in culture. But that is like a fish swimming in the sea. You can't taste the seawater if you're swimming in it. So how do you learn to taste the culture around you and figure out what it is and where it's going to be going? 
you pretend to elevate yourself. You can never really escape it, but like an anthropologist, you rise above it a little bit and set a separate personality, a separate perception up that tells you, okay, I'm not of this tribe for the moment. I'm different. I'm an alien being observing this. I'm a scientific mind, isolated, you know, great big giant brain out there observing you coldly and, and, and coolly and unsympathetically. Maybe sympathetically in this case. But what are you looking at? You're looking for the personalities of the tribes, the cultures around you, how they grew up, their history, their psychology, just like dealing with a human being. A culture is an extension, of course, of being human, but it does reflect the group think. And so you can actually kind of make up a character about a culture. And so we've got these, these icons we throw up, like Uncle Sam, you know, who I see driving down the road to, uh, to Nisqually every single day telling me things I don't believe Uncle Sam would actually say, but that's fine. You know, we've got parts of the community that are so off the wall that we can't hardly think about them without getting mad. Doesn't matter which side you're on. And all of these things build up to interfaces in law enforcement, in training, in education, so that the clash of the titans is always grinding along on where you are working as a student, as a teacher, and so on. How can you survive that? Because there's another old adage, which is it takes all kinds to make a world. This is literally true. It's true in your brain as well as in your everyday life. Your brain lies. You've got parts of your brain that are always flashing and asking for blood sugar. I can solve that problem. I can get you those resources. I know where to go to get that. And they go back and forth, and parts actually lie to each other to get blood sugar. But the whole thing is politically settled by your judgment engine. And if you're efficiently built and well-educated and, and well, well put together, your brain solved these things, but it wouldn't exist without the far ends of controversy and craziness. So if you listen to your brain, it can be scary. You can come up with all sorts of weird, I hope it's not just me. <laughs> In the depths of the night, you can listen to your brain murmuring to itself and you go, oh my God, am I a psychopath? No, because you don't act on those things. All of these crazy elements in your brain come together to form your personality just as they do in our culture. And you can't get along without the mad uncle in the attic who's sitting there typing weird missives to the letters, to the newspaper and so on. You can't get along without these people, but we have to get along with them. And that's the hard part. So as you fit into this, if you elevate yourself up, but you don't completely isolate yourself with this realization that everybody is necessary, you make bad mistakes. You say, the future must be this way because we need to achieve perfection. We need to achieve the nobility of this philosophical purpose. And you have the War of the Isms, which devastated the 20th century. And also probably the 13th century and the 15th century and the 17th century. I mean, this thing of we must all be one, we must all be the same, diversity is bad, that's the most dangerous philosophy of all. And so when you're a teacher, you're quite often saying, well, we can't really acknowledge those people because they don't acknowledge diversity. And that's the perverse quandary we have here. Yes, those people will destroy you if they get in control, but you can't live without them, literally because they're the crazy ones that start the conversation going when you won't. And they keep it going back and forth and swirling. So how do we, how do we cater to all these people? Go back to when I was in high school. Not only was there no beaming up Scotty and no warp drive to speak of among the high school kids I went with, but the discussion was almost a subconscious flow of history and information based upon what was available in the libraries, et cetera. Now that has been put on the internet. You can actually get access to the deep subconscious of the culture on the internet, and it's not pretty. <laughs> Sometimes it really is scary, irritating, aggravating, devastating, innervating, but it's there. It's the greatest tool writers and teachers have ever had because you can literally go access the subconscious of your community because some people don't really think when they're typing on their keyboard. It used to be that you know, the phone conversations would be that way, but you didn't hear them. We still don't have records of those phone conversations from 1968. You know, very few of them exist anymore. So all the mutterings that go on throughout the culture. So what are we looking for in the future? The empowerment of the mass of people is not practical. A, they don't know what they want, they don't know what they need. B, they want to be told what they want and what they need, but they don't want to listen to those tales. So 
if we're trying to define what the future is, is it access to information? Is it unfettered access to information at all levels? Well, you can't allow that in a school because someone's going to shut you down. You literally can't allow that in a bookstore, in a library. You can't have the open collection systems for students because you don't want your students to learn certain things at this stage in their lives. You don't want them exposed to that. But now on the internet, they are. There's not a damn thing you can do about it. It's just like going into downtown San Diego in 1968 where all the sailors hang out and see the tattoo parlors and everything. That's in every single home and every single library. And it's pretty wild. And so all your kids are now exposed to the deep subconscious of the culture. Well, are you going to shut that down? Some people say, yes, we don't want our kids exposed to that. Okay. What's the happy medium here? What's the thing? So let's take a look 20 years down the road to where our kids may be and where we may be. Now, right now, we've got iPhones. We've got computers, but that's all external. Imagine, if you will, that your circuits are now growing through your skin, that you can go and, 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 and put a, a tattoo on that will carry your personal information. You can port each other by clasping hands. It'll exchange your personal information if you tell it to. It'll listen to your bone phone or whatever you've got going as you're speaking. All of that stuff, when you walk into your house, you run your hand past the portal and it uploads all your stuff. And there's just 24-hour video running too, through your eyeglasses or a built-in camera or whatever you want. There it is. The computer is your skin. It layers through your skin, whether they install it or wire it through your skin or whether it grows there like nanotech, I don't know. Probably they'll install it at first. It'll be like chipping you. So you'll have all of this stuff, a key that allows you to be who you are and get access to everything that you should be getting access to. But of course, someone's going to hack that. And so what happens, it's like a Philip K. Dick story, love Philip K. Dick stories, or a Ray Bradbury story, when you are in fact thinking you're connected to the community and you're not. You know, we have our seashell ears in Fahrenheit 451 playing music to us constantly. We have our wall screen TVs. We have all of these demands of the culture and the economy around us telling, do this, be that, you must be this. Fashion consciousness, oh my God. I have been more scared of fashion magazines than I have of communist literature <laughs> for 50 years. Okay, because fashion magazines say, this is the future for the next three minutes. And then three minutes later, this is the future. Why? Because they're trying to grab your money. They're looking for your blood sugar. They want to solve this problem for you. You're not alluring enough. Well, I've known that for generations. So, you know, you're not ready to go out in public the way you're dressed. What's fashion consciousness like in the tech world? What's Wired Magazine? Where nerds acquire fashion consciousness. How cool is that? They try. Okay. But along the way, suddenly comes the iPad, the iPhone, you know, movies that make a billion dollars, and the nerd culture is now interfacing. So is the future going to be a future of nerds? Yes. But what about all the other folks out there who are fashion conscious, who really do want to, you know, study the style, the design, and everything? Part of that is nerd-like uh, in many respects. I have no problem watching uh, uh, fashion shows on, on TV. What's our favorite show that we were watching? Not Queer Eye for the Straight Guy. That was also fun, but... Project One Way, I would sit down and analyze all the fashion designs there and run away with all the things I would be doing. So, you know, fashion consciousness can't spread out. What are we going to be doing when we are the culture, when we don't have to go outside to our computer, but it's there right in front of us? So these glasses will be three-dimensional portals to your whole world. They can be supplemental, like, you know, T-1000 sitting there staring at you, taking your clothing size so you can steal your bike, you know. All these things can be there for you. They're used in heads-up displays now for cars. But imagine that being built in. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to be distracted by it? Are you going to sit back in classroom watching a 3D movie on your glasses and your teacher doesn't know? You know, he's just zoned out. No, he's watching Avatar for the thousandth time, okay? What are we going to do with this when the old dichotomy of connectedness versus isolation and individuality come to clash on a level where you are given complete freedom at the personal level to access anything you want. Just pay for the bandwidth. What's that like for a society? What's that like when all the constraints are pulled off, when all the irritating teachers can't tell you what to do, when all the politicians can't tell you what to look at, when you have complete First Amendment freedom of access to everything out there, which they call information, 
but which is not necessarily informative, which is in fact persuasive, dissuasive, uh, commercial speech, inclined to push you in a certain direction, changing your behavior. You're wrapped in this sea of culture, of this commercial culture, this philosophical hotbed, this, this intense downtown atmosphere of interaction and argument and persuasion and debate and false information and craziness and weirdness, and you're out in the middle of the countryside. The city is everywhere. The city has now taken over the entire planet. You can't get away from it. You're addicted to it. You can't take your glasses off because you'll miss up on that latest update or that latest interaction. It's Twitter, it's everything, except it's now in your skin. And eventually, it's in your head. Because they can put it there. Why not? And then you just update with brain surgery every two or three years, you know? But then you're updating your operating system, too. So you're plugged into the wall, waiting for access to Microsoft. Okay, you know, I gotta, <laughs> I'm, I'm full of viruses, you know. I need to get all that stuff out. Something keeps flashing in my, my eyeglasses, and, you know, it wants me to go to this website and, and spend thousands of dollars on, I don't know, acai berries or whatever. All of this is part of the culture that you are swimming in and that the teacher has to analyze and figure out. It's not getting easier to be a teacher by any means because you don't know what you should be teaching. But the old standard for education everywhere has been since time immemorial, since the days of the Peripatetics and, and Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, has been give them access to where they can find out what they need to know. Teach them how to use those access points reasonably and efficiently and how to critically evaluate the information that they are receiving. That is education. It is not passing information on, it's passing information on how to use information, how to access it, how to touch it, and how can you do that without imposing your own cultural constraints, without going back to those isms and saying, oh my God, I really want you to be like this, I really want you to do this, and I think like this, and large portions of our communities still act this way, that education is indoctrination. They want tradition to be passed on. If we say, no, 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 that's wrong, then guess what? It's like a missionary walking into a community in Borneo and saying, no, 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 you're doing it all wrong. You haven't understood the problem sufficiently here, which is a tribal community has its strengths and its character and its history and its own psychology. And if you go in and try and upset that community, how often have we seen this new ministers come into a church, young, fresh out of seminary school, and they tell the church, this is the new teaching, this is how it really is, this is what the Bible really says, and the church community goes, eh, next. Same thing in politics, politicians understand this instinctively. Everybody is facing one version or another of a tribal culture. Education has been dominated for many, many years now, for decades, by the Northeastern uh, Ivy League way of teaching. Certainly in the English classes, but also in other classes as well. If it comes out of the Ivy League schools, it is gospel. If it comes out of New York, it is gospel. We all tow to the line of the New York Times bestseller list. We don't really want to examine how all these things are done or what the decisions were made. We don't actually do a cultural examination of how New York culture, actually it's New York Boston culture because that interaction goes back to the 1850s. The Brahmins versus the New York business people. And they took over the whole you know, apparatus of literature and publishing and everything. That's where teachers focus their attention. So for many, many decades now, teaching has been, let's teach the canon. That which is understood by the Ivy League universities as being the core important curriculum. We must teach that. Everything from Henry James to Edith Wharton on down to F. Scott Fitzgerald, who I love. I love most of these writers. I love the whole Northeastern ethic. You know, I can argue about Henry James and H.G. Wells back and forth. They were friends at one time. We can go back and forth on all of that, but that is where our teaching comes from. How many of us have realized that as we grow up in teaching? That it's the Ivy League domination. And you know who resents that? Conservatives. A, the Ivy League tends to be kind of, uh, at, at, at a polite way, agnostic. And so you get all of these, you know, back and forth between the scientific community, the literary community, and the religious community, and the conservative community, and all the variations in between, where they are telling each other how to think. But if you're part of the Ivy League, 
you're teaching canon. You're teaching the good rules about literature and life and psychology and science. And if you're in the Christian community, you're going, no, no, no. That's not what we're here for. And back and forth. And out of this comes American culture. Always out of this interface comes American culture. And sometimes it blows up on our faces. Sometimes the conservative community has gotten really gnarly, like in the Deep South in the 1850s. You know, just things really going to hell, nothing changing, ruralism gone mad, or, or aristocratic thinking and, and, and plantation aristocracy gone mad, and we have to settle that out. What we're settling out now is the reduction of the power of any particular cultural group to control what you have access to. New York Publishing is now up against the, the East Coast, is now up against the West Coast, and they're scared. I've been here on the West Coast for a long time, and I've met a lot of these people, and I've written articles about the future of publishing and education and so on, which I've, I, in, in 1992, in, or 93, in New Zealand, I delivered a talk to the New Zealand Librarians Association. What are libraries going to be like in an age of electronic books? Scary. If Google Books can provide every single book from Stanford and Harvard, et cetera, for page views or for research views, or to actually download as a PDF if they're public domain, where do libraries fit into this? So now they're challenging what a library is. Where is the library? Is it a physical place? Is it a state of mind? Physical libraries are wonderful. We all were raised in physical libraries. We all love physical libraries. Don't need them anymore. What about schools? What if you are now able to self-educate to a high level in any area, but you're not receiving the imprimatur of a university? Are you educated or not? So when I researched Darwin's radio, I spent seven years following my bent through every single textbook, talking to scientists, doing all of this stuff on my own. Self-educated, English major, scary, stupid, right? Get it all wrong. That book is still current. It was published in 1999 and basically finished in 1997. It still is read by biologists going, huh? I didn't know that. Is that right? Yes. Because I listened to scientists all over the world murmuring about things and picked out what I thought was important. Not everyone is going to be, have the time to do that or the freedom to do that, but many will. How do you evaluate them? If you come into a classroom and you've got this student who Scary? They seem to know so much, but it doesn't fit the canon. What they're telling you doesn't fit what you're supposed to be teaching them. Do you go, no, 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 that's wrong? That'll get you in trouble with a student at the very least. Do the, pe the parents come in and say, no, we taught them free education, free thinking. Don't try and clamp down on them. And now it's in your bone, it's in your flesh, it's in your head, it's in your eyeglasses. Whatever you've got, all that world is available to you out there. Now what does that mean for Snohomish County? This is a lovely place that is an interface between urban and suburban and country. You've got all different kinds of people. The typical back and forth between the country and the city is the country is conservative, the city is liberal. Not always the case, but that's been since time immemorial, that was the flesh pots of Egypt versus the desert tribes. We've still got that to some extent. So you're an interface on that creativity. What does the interface mean? That's where creativity happens. In the communities where things aren't settled, where there are arguments and questions and debates. You've got to look at the richness of that argument, of the interface between different communities, different tribes. It's on the margins of a population that evolution really happens fast, where the things are challenged. So you've got all these vast herds flocking over the plains of Africa. It's where the predators can pick them off that the thinking really happens, on the outskirts, on the margins. That's what evolution is. Evolution is being challenged by things you don't want to deal with. And that which does not kill you makes you very, very ill. No, no, wait, wait, I got that wrong. That which does not kill you is supposed to make you stronger. But does it? If you're constantly facing, in a really rapidly changing culture, having to change your mental attitude so often, you just don't know who you are anymore. And this is what it's like to go into the big city. So as Snohomish is interfacing with all this citified information, it's losing its rural character in a real way. Is that something that we should regret? Is it something we, we pay attention to? Do we have enclaves preserved of Amish types who have no iPhones and, and no, no skin-embedded computers or 3D eyeglasses or anything? 
How do we preserve the strength of our conservative communities when they are challenged out of existence? And that's what's been happening to the conservative communities in the United States for the last 300 years. They've lost on every single major issue. No wonder they're getting gnarly. They don't know who they are or what they are now. And liberals haven't won either, because the Northeast is being sectioned up and, and divided away. Amazon is, is, is stealing the lunch for New York Publishing. Microsoft has no respect for the business people in the East Coast because they're so old and nasty, right? Unlike our, our young and nasty types. The West, in this area, around Snohomish, the feeder communities here, this is the most revolutionary community on Earth for now. India, China will take us over in the next 50 years. And, there, and believe me, when I, when I talk to Indian um, science fiction fans and tech people and so on, or when Rick Rashid, one of our friends who is the head of Microsoft Research, goes to India to recruit, to set up schools and universities there and talk about that, this is huge. They're better mathematicians than we are by long tradition. And China, there's an untapped potential there. But what about our untapped potential? Let's go back to the local community. How do we interface with the revolutionary fervor that's spreading everywhere from Redmond to South Lake Union to, uh, to, to Portland, Canada? How do we interact with that? How do we prepare our children for it? We don't. We can't. To be a teacher now is not just to go with the flow, it is to understand that your tribe, your set of tribes, you have to understand their values and you cannot stomp on them without being the same, committing the same sort of sin that a missionary would have committed in, say, Hawaii or Borneo to get rid of that traditional thinking. You work with it. They're people. You help them. You don't disparage their beliefs. Christopher Hitchens wrote a book saying, there is no God, there is no God, screw you. Sells copies, right? How is that any different from Ann Coulter writing a book saying, you godless liberals, back and forth, back and forth. You don't go with that. You have fun with it. You don't work against it. A teacher has to tap dance and cash checks every single day in ways that would just amaze any actor or any filmmaker. You are an entertainer. You are an anthropologist. You are a technological maven. And you have to do all of this and maintain your own life and culture, your own interior thoughts. How do you do it? How do you be physician? and Jane Goodall, and facilitator, and understander, and psychologist all at the same time. I don't know. You asked me in here to talk about this stuff, but I really want to listen to you guys, because I spend most of my time sitting alone in a room writing. I have a gnarly personality. You know, I, I, I can't be taken out in public very often. You know, if I do, my wife here has to kind of rein me in every now and then. But she has a wicked sense of humor, too, so I, I rein her in occasionally. But are you allowed as a teacher to have a wicked sense of humor? My God, you have to have it internally. How often can you voice it? How often can you give vent in a classroom? And all your, your students will then say, well, he's the best teacher we have, and all the parents will go, you're fired. You know? <laughs> Twas ever thus in high school. So I'm here to listen to you guys as much as anything, and, and you know, we've thrown a few interesting ideas out there, but in terms of how far down the road we go, 5, 10, 20, 50 years, that's a practical question I think we need to address with all of your expertise. So I don't know how you want to do that. Do you want to break up into groups and discuss or just start, t start the discussion here with questions? Yes, ma'am. I like the idea that this is the Harvard University of Washington Post is doing that to order books and stuff like that. But where do we go? Where do you go to hear that? You need a teacher to help you. Yeah, your kids. I am one. But yeah. I, but I, yeah. Yeah, and my sons will occasionally say, well, haven't you ever been to Reddit? Or why aren't you listening to so and so? I'm like, yeah, but I don't spend the kind of time that right. he spends, and I don't have the kind of time. The proper response is, no, I have a life, dear. Well, yeah. Yeah, and, that, and that, that doesn't get the discussion going, does it? But, but you know about it, though. Yeah, I suppose, but do you think that's kind of what... You can't immerse yourself in it, because that's not where you are. No. And they don't want you to be there. No. Like teachers, like parents, and so on, you, they don't want you to be the ultimate hipster. They want you to tell them when they've overstepped the bounds and maybe they have them, maybe they haven't, but they want the choice to go, okay, that was really stupid, wasn't it? No, maybe not. But you tell them that, and they go, and that's the interface again. Parents, kids, teachers are all part of that. So yeah, you are a balancing act. There's a lot of places I don't go on the internet that our daughter goes, okay, I've got a life. 
you know. But that was the same thing my parents thought when I was reading science fiction books. You know, the dozen a day. My God, doesn't he ever get out and do exercises? Mm-hmm. Apparently not. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a big question. Yes, ma'am. I like what you said about, you know, can we shape a, a preferred future? Uh, sometimes I feel like we're just all on a runaway, uh, runaway train and, and, and you can't get ahead of it. But I wonder, you know, you said that you function, or we need to function as anthropologists, and I look past and say, well, when did we shape a preferred future? And how do you know in that effort of shaping that you're not just shackling it? Yeah, exactly. The zeitgeist is really hard to grab hold of. And now it's a world zeitgeist. It's not just the USA, which is part of the problem we're having here is, yeah, we're leaders, but we're always being challenged by those who might be leaders in 20 years. So it scares us. So we try to improve. But in terms of figuring out how we shape the future, we don't really. But to be aware of it and to go with the flow is like riding a wild whitewater raft. Is That's what the future is and always has been, certainly through the 20th century. Nowadays, you cannot have uh, cultural tyrants running your lives. They try but they're very ineffective about it, and they're kind of sad to watch. Sad and noble like, you know, dinosaurs whose eggs are being eaten by these little mammals running around. We see them. They're still stately. But we go with the flow. That doesn't mean we don't try to direct the flow. If you don't necessarily want to go up that tributary, you have the right not to. Your, your kids, your students, you have the right to direct them away from that tributary. But to what extent do you have to be wise to find those tributaries and save them from them. You know, the branch lines of development in the future can be really bad. That's why science fiction, two thirds of science fiction is very dark. It's really hard to find prognosticative science fiction that says, the bright and shining future. No, it's don't burn books, don't do this, don't have you know, televised helicopter chases of your criminals. Well, we do. So, that's the dystopic view of the future, which warns us against these things. Now, what, what's more impressive, say, Thomas More's Utopia or 1984? Well, p- powerful emotion is fear and disgust. So 1984 really shaped 20th century culture. And yet, what War- Orwell was describing was not the future. He wanted to call his book 1948. He was describing Stalinist Russia and what might happen if England went down the economic road to where that sort of thing became possible. And it scared the hell out of us. And it had certain technological things in it, you know, the, the universal monitoring device in your house watching you, Big Brother watching over you, and that's here. It was actually kind of here in 1948 if you read all the spy novels back then. They could bug you. Now they can bug anything. So if you've heard about, uh, I'll, I'll divaricate a bit here, uh, if you've heard about the latest massive wars in the uh, malware industry. They call them Red October and Flame and uh, what was the other one? Uh, Stuxnet, Stuxnet, where the murmurs across the entire neurological system of the internet are being kind of tracked and manipulated by very, very powerful and intelligent people, some of whom may have actually written the operating systems they're now infecting. That's biological. That's how DNA got started, you know? To this day, that's how biology works. So the internet is acquiring the sort of creepy sense of life and war and everything else that everything else, how do we shape that? We put our foot down, we are allowed to. We are not supposed to be, when we're not teachers or politicians, we are ourselves. We separate that out and we say, this shall not stand, you shall not pass, I've had it, I'm mad as hell, I'm voting against you, you're out of here, okay? You have the right to do that. And in a way, that part of the murmur helped shape the future. But no single person, even those who believe they are shaping it, are powerful individually enough now to dictate the future. That game is over. Until, until it happens again, I could be wrong. But I don't think so. You know, we don't have the, the, uh, um, the privileged kind of teenage dictator ruling over the airwaves with a mainframe system controlling everything you have. Except now we're putting stuff up on, on the cloud. That's creepy. I don't like that. We've already had cloud failures. Vast server farms going down, you know, because someone shut off the water supply or whatever. Is that... Yeah. <laughs> so shaping the future, you've got to watch it closely. You've got to scream when you want to. 
and be individual, but when you're in a professional capacity, a doctor, a teacher, a uh, politician, you can't really afford to be ignorant of the forces around you. I don't know how to personally maintain this, you know, I, because I, I haven't had a real job for 35 years. So I'm not necessarily the practical person to talk to about psychologically how you do this, because I can play scenarios in my head all day and no one hears them. But if you're at work on the coffee break and you start spouting some of that stuff, you're going to get in trouble. Yes, ma'am. So uh, midway through the talk, you mentioned, or you said, the empowerment of the masses is not practical. Then you went on to speak about staging, and, and I think we're getting towards kind of the idea of maturity and staging. I would love to hear you speak to that just a little bit. Oh, well, maturity is a big issue. See, when you've achieved maturity, you've stopped being kind of unpredictable and crazy. And right now, America is still in its late adolescence. So it still has a lot of zits to go through. <laughs> when you look at a state or a nation or a culture that has, in fact, acquired maturity, it is a little more comfortable, a lot less creative, and a little more sane. So we're, f we're afraid of those mature cultures. Now, if you look at old cultures, they're not necessarily mature. The Middle East is very, very old. It's very young, too, because they never have anything settled down, and the peoples and movements and everything are perpetually young. It's like a giant grinding engine of, of culture. You look at India, it should be old. Some parts of it are. It keeps regenerating itself. It's an amazing youth generator, a billion and a half people. China is going to become more and more like that as things kind of, as the isms kind of fade away. So how do we, I'm forgetting what your actual question is. Um, you said the empowerment of the masses is not practical, which seems, just at that point, to take that out of context, seems very different than the thrust of most of what you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Even worse, I don't remember saying that, so I've been babbling again. The fact is, the empowerment of the masses that you control is not practical. You cannot control the masses. In other words, you cannot empower the masses to do what you want them to do, right? So if you, if you think what I'm doing is empowering the masses, eventually they're going to turn against you and you lose your business model and you fade away. And you know, if you're a tastemaker, they're not going to always flock your direction. Unless you're Stephen King, in which case it lasts forever. He's our Dickens, so maybe he can do it. Um, so maybe that's what I'm talking about, is, is you can't control the empowerment. Uh, and I think that's pretty obvious. As teachers, you realize you're not really in charge. You may think you are. They may even tell you you are. But then they bring you down. So. Yes, sir. So uh, I was in China at the beginning of this year, and we were sitting around a table with the, you know, the Googles and the, and the Twitters of China. And uh, we were talking about the big fear that everybody outside of China has, which is you bring information into China, and now everybody has access to that information. That technology gets reproduced and you know, relabeled. Um, and they were as passionate about their perspective as we were about ours. They said, you don't get it. You don't understand. We have to share information. That's how we are going to uh, progress. That's how we are going to compete in this global economy. That's how we're going to, you know, that's how we're going to drive technology. It's better for everybody if we do this. Um, and then we see, you know, the, the Facebook coming out with their public server, right? They've taken and invested who knows how many hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, server innovations, and then they go out and they open source it. Right, so that everybody can have access and everybody can benefit from it. Um, how do you see that evolution of sharing information changing rather than you know, the, the old staunch way of companies protecting their IP? It's really aggravating. One of the things about the early computer industry was uh, open, net, open source was great because you would get work consulting after you provided a piece of open software. And their model was, look at the Grateful Dead. They never sell albums. They just sell concert tours. Well, that model didn't work if you're a small business setting up an IP or whatever, um, and, and uh, someone steals it from you. You're gone. You vanish. The IP is out there. The society doesn't suffer much. But eventually, that kind of theft of information provides less incentive to develop the IP. And so the IP development is then centered in large corporations that have that ethic of, well, we can still get a gig later because I'm a CEO. And you know I can, I can do consulting and teaching, if nothing else, after my career falls apart. IP, the protection of IP, in a land of information wants to be free, is a fascinating problem to deal with. And China really wants access to all the stuff they didn't develop, 
because they were held back for 500 years, right? And so now they want to catch up. Same thing with Russia, same thing with, to some extent with India, um, and all of that, they want to catch up with us. How do they do that? By piracy. Pirates have been around for thousands of years. I think Pompey stomped them down in the Mediterranean once, you know, then they came back quickly. It's not a, it's not a good long-term business model because you must establish relationships. And so eventually the piracy kind of gets put away, which is what's happening now on the internet. Uh, and, and, and governments start moving in to protect their particular local communities of IP providers. And to some extent, innovation gets stomped down for a little bit. Then it finds other avenues. It's, it's biology. Economics is biology. And it's never pretty. But yeah, it's fun, fun to watch that. And, and also, you know, the, the whole Hollywood thing is we're a huge, massive studio. We just ground on $160 million for this movie. And the week before it's released, it's on video in China. Right? That's aggravating. But you are a huge, massive studio controlling the flow of information in a world where everyone wants to make their own movie. You are being phased out. You don't have many years left on this earth. So, what's going to happen on that? Yes, sir. The question there was about intellectual property and about you know, movies and, and ideas, books, processes. Uh, there's an old uh, Twilight Zone episode, original, where this man stumbles into a town and he can't leave, and it's not William Shatner. And the, uh, the guys, the, the elders of the town decide to use the device, and it's this, uh, they've got a machine where they can put a little funny squiggly diagram, it's a punch card essentially, that they put it in and it spits out a gun. And right now, at the University of Texas, there's a guy creating a file to print a gun. So what when it's not ideas, or movies, but when it's, it's actually things. What is that, that there, there's no control of the manufacturer, not just of information, but information as expressed in atoms? Yeah, that's, that's the, the scariest thing of all for manufacturing is not, not digital bits can be duplicated, but actual objects. Uh, so you, you, know, you, you can make a car in your backyard, print it. Damon Knight wrote a story called A for Anything back in the 1960s, where you had this printing machine that just made anything, and it was perfectly indistinguishable from the other thing. Well, that was inherent in the whole notion of the fly or Star Trek, the transporter beam. You know, I don't know why poor um, Bones would say, he's dead, Jim. Because obviously there's a backup copy of him in the transporter that they keep there just to make sure he's, you know, to do the drug tests on the crew, which is really important at times. So. The implications of technology are really fascinating. Is this still fantasy technology? Well, yeah, this is mostly plastic stuff, but they're also doing metal deposition things. So we're at Ficheri Jewelry downtown, and they're, they're having jewelry brought in that's actually metal deposited printer jewelry. Can be very intricate, you know, you don't need to. So there go all the, all the ivory carvers of the Orient that would create those, those nested balls with really intricate talents, and you can do that now with a printer. But can they actually create cars? Not yet. So when that happens, A for anything really is cool because all of manufacturing goes right out the window, except for those people providing the slurry that is the printer's ink. And that'll be just like what happened to Kodak and to everything else. So I was reading just yesterday, there's a, a company that's providing uh, ways to break down normal plastic so that they can now be put in these green printers. Yeah. You can take any plastic at all. It, you were discussing earlier about like the availability of information and just you know there's so much out there and things that like I had no idea about until I was in my late thirties. My fifteen year old like knows more about these subjects than I do now just because it's available, right? And I think that's awesome. I think that's great. And and I think that the important part is teaching him how to, you know how to think rather than you know oh I don't want him to know about this. I want him to be able to think about this. So Critical if I can print a, a, a magazine that has a hundred bullets in it, right? I mean, I don't want I don't want that to be prohibited. I don't want the government to say, "Oh no, that's illegal." Well, I can print it myself in my bedroom. How are you going to stop me, right? What I want is my son to be able to go. There's no need for me to have a, a you know a magazine with a hundred bullets in it, right? I, I want him to be able to think about what he's doing rather than prohibit him from even thinking. So I want to get get away from this. Let's, let's stop, you know, 
obviously there's things that we don't want our kids to have available at school, right? But they can use Tor and we can't stop them, right? If they know what they're doing on the computers, and I'm sure they know more than us, then they can do it anyway. Yeah, it's that kind of creepy Village of the Dam sort of thing, you know. Stay, stay away from all those weird blue-eyed, blonde-haired kids clustering together in the corners. You know, learn not to think out loud in front of them. Well, science fiction has the metaphors for this, but we don't know what the outcome is. So one of the ultimate metaphors uh, comes through City in the Stars by Arthur Clarke, where he has a billion years in the future. You can think and something appears. You can design your apartment, all the furniture appears. You know, and you can redesign that and, and starts off with what amounts to a giant computer video game in the lair of the white worms, basically. They're chasing each other around in virtual reality. This is 1953, you know. We also had The Velt, Ray Bradbury's The Velt, where a bunch of kids imagine a jungle, actually a velt, and, and lions, and the parents go in there and metaphor upon metaphor, parents don't really get that these are actually dangerous lions. The kids have acquired the ability to visualize so intensely that the lions eat you. You know, there's all these scary stories. Well, Hollywood came along and stole on Arthur C. Clarke's idea, because Arthur's basically a very civilized and, 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 and nice guy. They said, you don't understand. Forbidden Planet, that technology is what wiped out the Krell. Because they turned on that machine that allowed you to visualize and create anything your mind wanted, and they forgot about the id the dark subconscious of the Freudian 50s rises up and you see it, you know, a Disney artist actually sketches it out for you and it's terrifying. And all the upper brain thinkers in the Krell civilization didn't realize about the dark underpinnings. In other words, they weren't really anthropologists, they were all angelic lofty thinkers. And they forgot about the demonic. So the demons showed up. They didn't even know they were there. And as Walter Pigeon says, my poor Krell, how after Millions of years of evolution and advancement had you not realized that you still had the monster from the id. Cool stuff, all metaphors, all appropriate to the discussion of, yes, I can print bullets in my bedroom. Really? Bombs? C4? Sarin nerve gas? You know, what else are you going to be able to print in your bedroom? Do we have a Twilight Zone future in which all these houses all over the neighborhood as you pull back are blowing up? Because all the people have started printing stuff they shouldn't be? You know, that's, a, that's not a bad Twilight Zone episode. I could, you know, I could do that one. Yeah, there's so much for us to think about in terms of this. This is still kind of fantasy technology, uh, but only for the interim. If you have complete control of the magnetic fields, as Dick Tracy suggested, we could control, well, actually, if you control printing, 3D printing, and get it very efficient and very, very fine, we can, you know, create friends. And then liberate them or not. What is that about, you know? Everybody, everybody who's a teenager watches those films. What's it, the weird science? You know, let, let's create the perfect uh, boyfriend, okay? Because they're hard to come by and they're not very good. You know, they're, not, they're not mature. Well, we can, we can mature them in the vat before they're ever created and, and then they'll be perfectly ready for us. But then you've got Beauty and the Beast, you know, where she liberates the prince from the beast and she cries out, as he appears to her, who am I bet? Where is my beast? There's so many metaphors that we deal with in fantasy, in literature, in art, which are appropriate to our lives that we use as psychological tools to immunize ourselves against future shock, but also perhaps to prepare ourselves for the problems we will face. I don't know how far down the road the uh, infinitely dense printer technology will take us, but you know, you can always cut off the flow, just like we cut off natural gas lines to houses that are dangerous. You can cut off the flow of printer slurry to houses that are blowing up. They still have to use matter. Now imagine that they can teleport it. They don't need to worry about pipelines. Don't need no stinking pipelines. Right, right. Well, you need some metals, you need some other things to get some of these things done. You need phosphates for explosives, by and large. So. Uh, so, in, in terms of uh, three-dimensional printers, just, uh, I found out within the last year uh, it became possible to print a house, like literally to print a house using three-dimensional printer. And there's talk of using uh, organic matter in organic printers to print out things like veins and organs. Uh, they have bloody lack of. You can do the, the substrate at the very least right now. Yeah. Uh, sugars and polylipids. Uh, so, really, it makes sense of that. But uh, I wanted to actually talk a little bit about. Um, 
the idea of, of William Gibson that he said the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. Uh, because with all this amazing technology, I still have students occasionally who don't own a cell phone, which is right. like heresy nowadays. Uh, but I have students who at home don't have a computer. Uh, I have students who don't know how to use Microsoft Word. Right. Um, I have students you know, who, who don't have a normal printer to just print their assent, uh, who, have, who have almost no access whatsoever to technology. And I think that's going to continue to be the case for a long time. They're not Amish. They just don't have, and a lot of it's tied into socioeconomics uh, because of poverty. Uh, but I'm wondering if in the future, information is like new currency and access to technology becomes so ubiquitous to almost everyone else. Uh, how do we best serve these people who sort of become, you know, this, this more, more, not through their own choice necessarily, but who are kind of out of that world, you know, who feel like the muggles amongst all the magical people. The outliers. Uh, how, how do we help them, how do we serve them effectively if they're just being, you know, put aside and left behind? Our group exercise for this, this morning is write a Twilight Zone episode that uses all of these currents. So any thoughts? Got outliers, you've got the dialed in, you've got the trendy and the connected, and you've got those who aren't. What's the Twilight Zone story that we're looking for here? There actually probably was a Twilight Zone episode, I don't know. Well, we'll start you off. Something goes wrong, the machine stops. And all the people who rely for their lives, their entertainment, their psychology, on their connectedness, don't know what to do with themselves. And the outliers, the poor kid in his bedroom who never was connected to all this stuff, who still reads books, teaches them how to use the library, which is locked up, so they get, you know, they get the, the bolt cutter out and they go back into the library and they open it up, and they go back to the old technology while they sort out the new. Outliers exist in all of us, because there's sometimes when the big old system gets it wrong. And they love, outliers, a lot of outliers love to come fully armed to the apocalypse so they can go steal gasoline for the rest of their lives, you know, like Humongous in Mad Max. That's a real vision of the future, which outliers rule. But, but the, the real truth of the outlier is the outlier is there to protect you against making a universal mistake. So value them. Their insight is like having someone from the 19th century in your classroom. You don't point that out to the other students, but it's my God. But as an anthropologist, you go, this is cool. They aren't attached. Maybe I'm too attached. What can I learn from those people who aren't here yet? And I think that's, that's what all teachers kind of do when you're bringing your students along, is you realize that their weaknesses are not necessarily weaknesses. They could be extraordinary strengths, new ways of insight. They're observing you going, huh? My God, you're funny looking. You're funny looking with all those earbuds and, and your phones glued to your eyeballs and not happy unless there's a new Apple product, you know? I'm just happy reading uh, Jane Austen. Thank you. You know? I will go back and I will understand the past cultures in the way you don't have time for anymore because you're so locked up in your present culture. They will become the explorers that understand the past when you are there trying to promote the future. Yes, ma'am. Um, when someone asks me like what the future classroom looks like, I, uh, my imagination goes by and robots and teachers with lasers come up. I was just wondering, uh, what do you have like in, going around in your head with the future classroom? I actually tried to visualize a scenario for one of her dad's books, for a book called Tau Zero, where we open up the film by circling around a classroom 200 years in the future. And it's still students, it's still a teacher, but all the students have visualizations on their desk that they're looking at of this giant starship that's about to launch to the stars. So their visual aid is a three-dimensional thing they can look at, you know, a model on their desktops. And it's being projected from the desktop or from them. You don't know. You're just seeing this in the movie. We don't know how it's being done. And as you go around, you realize, look, there's only five, ten kids in this classroom. Why? Because the culture has fewer kids now. It's mature. And there's a teacher. And the teacher is not a robot, but the teacher is basically there to supplement all the technology that's going on. And you have these wall screens which show you all the procedures across the room as you're rotating in this, in this 360 degree classroom. 
all the teacher d is doing is telling you a little more about what you're seeing on the screens as the Leonora Christina, this giant starship, is being built in orbit, as it's being planned, as the social systems are being set up for this 400-year voyage, and all this sort of thing. And all the students, they could be ranging in age all in one classroom from the age of 5 to 20. They're all together, and they're watching this. And then you fade. You freeze on the big screen and you fade to the Leonora Christina and your interface has now taught the audience through the metaphor of the future what this ship is all about. I don't know if that works. You know, are we going to have classrooms? Yes, because we want to interact. Now, my mentor in writing, I actually kind of go back and forth between Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury, but I knew Ray Bradbury quite well. And the one thing that drove him nuts was the notion that you would no longer have people sitting out on their front porches on a summer evening. You would no longer have the human connection. Because there's something about phones and about the internet and everything, you can't smell the people, you can't see them. They aren't there in front of you, real and in your face. And you don't have to behave the way you behave with people when they're in front of you. And I agree with that. Teaching is the same way. You need to have the teacher there because the teacher is a physical example. And whether or not the students mold themselves to that example or all the examples, because you have many, many teachers throughout your life, they have choices. And that human interface is utterly essential. We still need the front porch on a summer evening to sit out there and watch the people stroll by and say hello. You know, pet their dogs or whatever. They're out walking, they're out talking. And I kind of get back to what we're talking about Snohomish now. A community that empowers that, that doesn't just have tracked homes, but has sidewalks, that has, you know, interconnections that don't involve getting into a car, wrapping yourself in metal to do something, but that puts you out with a bandstand. The old Twilight Zone vision of the bandstand in Central, you know, which is like a set in, in, in uh, Paramount Studios. Um, but that is the vision of America that has lasted and haunted us since the schoolroom, the school marm, the teacher up there, the physical teacher, absolutely essential. The rest of it, I don't know. You can make it up as you go along. Depends on how much money you've got, uh, how much money there is in it, business-wise, to sell to these you know, needs or these, these, these visions. Uh, that's the other thing about economics is economics will put a clamp on your dreams faster than anything if A, you can't make a good business model out of it, and B, um, you can't copyright it or protect it, it goes widespread right away, then it becomes part of culture and not part of business. And, uh, interesting enough, in the whole software industry, like in the teaching industry, you cannot protect your talents for very long. You can't, you know, patent your talent as a teacher. The only thing you have going for you is your personality and your ability to interconnect on a day-to-day -day basis with human beings. And that's far more important than IP. Okay, um, I, mine's more of just a statement and maybe a question I'll Good. end up with. But I want you guys I, to take over now. I've been in the computer field and technology for many, 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 many years, and the one when I hear about where we're going and what, what we're concerned about for the future, we can't really control the information. But what I see, because I have a nine-year-old daughter, what I see is I can teach her about responsible computing and, and, and ethics and the humanity of you know, dealing with people and not thinking that just because this thing pops up on the screen that it must be true. Right. And to, to be able to go to the source and find out where that information is coming from is it true. And I told her, I said, you know, you're just walking down the street and find a piece of paper and you look at it and you go and you throw it away because you know it's junk. You don't know where it came from. You don't know who put it there. But yet on the internet we get, oh, it comes in the email. It must be correct. Right. You know, or, or I find it on some Joe Schmo's website, which, you know, that he, he must be personal if he has a website. So I try to teach my daughter that you have to find where that information came from. And yeah. so I think in teaching our children, to me, because we can't control information where it comes from, but we can teach our children to respond to it. Yeah. And, I, and I don't know how much we have that in the classroom in high school. How much people will let us have it is the question. You know, when you're telling kids how to discriminate between sources of information, you're often saying, this information is not um, useful in your context because it is slanted. 
and therefore you get people aggravated at you for saying that. But yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and you know, I think what you teach the kids is what you need to know is the best information available, the most unbiased information available to make your decisions. Look for the bias. If you find the bias, you can enjoy it, but take that as a grain of salt. And when I was researching Darwin's radio, I was all over the web, and I kept stumbling across these really interesting um, websites with multicolored type fonts and, and sort of flowery banners and stuff, and they were talking about biological issues. And I realized early on, very quickly, okay, these are Christian websites or, or fundamentalist websites trying to discourage approaches to evolution. What amazed me as the years went by, and they went by very quickly, was how sophisticated they were becoming. They were learning. They still tried to maintain their position on the issues, but they were posting more and more interesting comments and thoughts and so on, attacking kind of the hidebound evolutionary theories in the interest of promoting their own points of view. And they were upsetting a lot of scientists, but on the other hand, they were asking questions which were in fact very good. Now how fascinating is that? The opposition was getting opposition research to go up against the big boys that they were trying to bring down. They never quite got to the end result, but that's okay, because along the way, the debate was fascinating. And that's kind of how our society always works, is you never reach the end result. There is no ultimate conclusion as who's telling the truth or which opinion is the best, but it's the one that's most useful to you to advance your personal life and your agenda and your ability to interact in the world. And teaching that, if there's a class in that, I want to take it, because I'm still not perfect at it. I, I refuse, for example, to read reviews on Amazon because I find them entirely too corrective. Sure. Yes, sir. Uh, so you've spoken a lot on how we need to do further education and how the current system, I feel like, is not really working. I'm curious to see how you feel about how um, education is grouped based on kids who are of a certain age instead of a certain ability. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I don't say that education isn't working. Education has never worked. You never get educated the way you need to avoid making your mistakes. I mean, a teacher should be able to sit there and tell you, don't do that right before you do it and kick you and then divert you down the road. That, that's kind of what education is trying to be. But I like this approach of why do we group kids together by age rather than ability? Because we need to get the smart kids to realize what it means to be thick as a brick. And we need to have them be part of the community because they can't fix their own cars. They can't build the bricks. They can't put the community together. They can't lay the roads. They're not going to, but they're going to be working with those who do if they don't understand them. If they don't understand how valuable and rich their lives are and how similar to their, to their lives they are. So that's why we kind of do this is, is we are in a sense forcing a community, a small village upon the super bright. If you take the super bright and isolate them, um, they become a tribe unto themselves and they think very strange thoughts that may be disconnected from social reality. So I'd say, I, I would say I love the thought of a classroom that's from fifth grade to college level, but not by IQ. They don't believe IQ makes any sense. IQ can be changed by social circumstances. It's not genetically inbred. So if our kids who are very, very heavily nerd-like are put into a social situation where they must interact with society, they lose some of their nerdiness and they become more social. And we've actually seen this. Apparently there's evidence that autistic kids, some of them grow out of it as they get older. And we've seen that in some of our major movers and shakers in the Northwest here. So it's a big, big interesting question. But no, no educational system is ever going to be adequate. Just barely adequate is the best we can hope for. Yes, ma'am. Oh, <laughs> I'm not seeing all of them. Yes, ma'am. Well, this is more of a comment. It's kind of, in my mind, it's not the fact that we need to be afraid of the technology and information that we can access. It's the fact that we need to be afraid of how my generation after me and maybe your generation perceive the information. Because if we are getting to the point where we are becoming self-education, it's not the fact that we're going to lose the value of education because we as humans want to move forward and we want to grow more knowledge. But the thing that can be detrimental to us is the fact that we can't communicate with others. We're losing the skills that, you know, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Um, 
you know, watch out for others so us as a whole can create something wonderful. Mm -hmm. We're becoming so self-centered to the fact that we want to move on for us and only us and not someone else. So let's say we made this, you know, great vast majority of technology that could better our future and help us move forward and do great things, but we are so self-centered, we have lost the way to communicate with others that we can't do that, and in the end, if there was a catastrophe or something like that, we could not help because we wouldn't care anymore. Excellent points, and this, is, this goes back to that debate about the country versus the urban thing. The urban kid is raised where nearly everything is being catered to them, and so they live in a kind of upper brain or at least upper cultural bracket where they don't really see the underpinnings of the world. They don't see death, they don't see birth, they don't see any of this. They're isolated from all of it. The country kids, traditionally, not so much anymore, but traditionally are always on that interface of life and death. They're always on the cutting edge, on the margins of where things can go very badly wrong and you can lose the farm. Worse, you can buy the farm, okay? And so all of that goes back and forth as we put these things together. We are more and more urbanized, more and more self-centered, and there comes a point in the self-centered urban youth's awakening when they have to deal with real life, which it's a real shock. Maybe it happens in their own personal existence. Maybe it happens, you know, when someone dies that you love or there's an accident or whatever. The teen angel romantic song is about that awakening to death. And on the farm, the shock against life is inbred from a very early age in the countryside where you see death. So the more urban we become, the more accultured and technological we become, we're violating the Bradbury principle of you're not sitting out in the front porch talking to people anymore. You're not getting diverse opinions. Why? Because you're fitting into the echo chamber. You only hear what you want to hear. And you don't go around looking for opposing points of view. On a farm, there are 10 million opposing points of view. The animal's squawking for food, the pig that doesn't want to die, the cow that wants to be milked, the farmer who wants you to do this, and in a business, the same thing. Eventually, you're going to encounter that. So how do we get our kids to be more acculturated? I think it is by putting them in classrooms where they're not separated out by IQs. If all you've got is smart kids in a classroom, they can all reach agreement, and the agreement can be wrong, you know? Whereas if you have a few dumb kids <laughs> in the classroom, they're going to say, that's BS. You're so full of it, you know? Let's go outside and talk about this. Whoa, hey, I'm a nerd, you know. So all of that is part of this social interaction where we need the people around us to correct us, one way or the other. And sometimes it's not pretty. Sometimes they're wrong. Sometimes they're broken. And we're dealing with, you know, situations now where through no fault of society or biology or anything else, the age-old problem of broken people at which point do you decide that a student is broken, or a teacher is broken, or a parent is broken? When do you make that decision? We, are, we aim to not lock people away. We aim to work with them on that. But there are points when you can't. So that's one of the major problems we're facing right now, especially in education. You know, we're going to have armed guards everywhere. Why? Because 100 people a year, maybe, are going to die in situations like this. But it's a traumatic 100 people. This has been going on for a long time. I don't know if you remember in the 1920s when a guy planted a bomb underneath a school somewhere, by this Texas, and blew up the school and killed 28 kids one day. Okay? This is not new. This is not a sign of the, the, the deterioration of our society, per se. It's a problem we've always faced. How do you educate and deal with broken people? Are you broken? Am I broken? Yes. Sometimes the people around us help us with that. If we have these proclivities, which we can't interact in every situation perfectly, we have others to help us. When those nets are broken down through isolation, through self-isolation, through, through not needing to interact, to being urbanized, to where no one can judge us anymore because we're not in public anymore, that becomes dangerous. It's all very good points. Yes? Oh, yeah. So one of my questions is it seems through, throughout civilization as societies gain technology and gain enlightenment, so to speak, they always seem to implode on, on themselves. The, the Byzantines, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, the Romans, I mean, you can go throughout civilization and see where you've got these amazing, amazing civilizations that seem to implode upon themselves at some point. 
how do we move forward in, in technology and vision without imploding on ourselves? Well, first of all, we push away the barbarians. Those barbarians are nasty people. They don't believe what we believe. They want what we've got. And they try to impose their might upon us. The Romans managed to subvert them. They followed on Alexander's thing and, you know, bring them into the empire, eventually make them citizens. That lasted quite a long time. But when you had, you know, vast empires rising out of the desert, Islam and everything, this was terrifying. Uh, the biggest impulse to civilization in the history of the world is the steppes, steppes of Central Asia, the grasslands where people, nomadic peoples, would feed their cattle, move them to the north during the winter, move them to the south, uh, move them to the south during the winter, move them to the north, back and forth. Every so often the grasslands provided enough energy that hordes could move out. They would move down into Greece, they would become the Dorian invasion. They would move into uh, India, they would become, uh, first off, the, uh, the uh, people who pushed the Dravidians south, the Aryans sometimes they're called, and then they would become the Mughals, who are Mongols. The Mughal, the Mongol Empire ruled the world basically everywhere from just east of, of Poland to China for 150 years. And then went on ruling it off and on for another almost 1,000 years. The last Manchurian emperor was a Mongol by descent. This is civilization. We don't write about that history. Instead, we're interested in cities. The beginning of civilization is the city. It's not the horde rising up like a slime mold out of the vast energy grasslands and ruling and pushing and scaring the hell out of the cities. No, because they're not urbanized. No, they're just powerful and scary. And I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn in history that civilization is not, despite the name, entirely about cities. It's about what people do. And the power and the ethic and the changes they make to roil the streams, to muddy the waters, to shake things up. So thank God for the barbarians. And even to this day, we are being challenged by peoples who are sick of our being at the top of the pyramid. They are sick of our culture dominating theirs. They are sick of us sending out over the airwaves all this, from their point of view, absolutely polluting stuff that takes them beyond the 14th century into the 21st century. They don't like it. They reflect what's going on in our own country right now, where they don't like being brought up into the 21st century. They don't like it. We don't like it. Okay. Understanding all of this is how the military mind works to figure out where the hot spots are going to be. Where are these emerging creative moments? Where are these emerging resentments? Who's in charge here? Who's ambitious here? Who can bring all that together and be the new barbarians? Because when you choose your enemies properly, you get stronger. When you don't acknowledge them and you choose them improperly and make enemies, you get weaker. What we need to do is something that we've never really been capable of doing within the United States because we are isolated. We haven't faced major invasion in a long time. Okay? We invaded ourselves the last time. That was kind of nasty. So what we need to realize is we don't want to be imperialistic. We want to be outreaching. And that's hard for a lot of our communities to understand because we come from an ethic, especially the country ethic, which is Bad behavior must be punished painfully to teach you otherwise. And so we, to this day, with our criminals, with other people outside of us, with the, in the world that doesn't agree with us, we want to punish them. We want the Quentin Tarantino moment out there in history, where the satisfaction of laying waste to one's enemies, this biblical urge to bring them low, low the mighty are fallen, you know, Okay, that's us now. You read the New Testament, we're the flesh pots of Egypt. We're no longer the desert tribes. So that's that flow of history. And it's fascinating. It's great to read about it. It's terrible to live it. Terrifying, not terrible. Yes. Have a here. Sure, yes, ma'am. Okay, so the way I see shaping the future is taking all of our, like, thinking of our problems and finding like figuring out our preferred solution for that. And I think, I wanna like take like 20 steps back here and go back to what our problems are. Okay. And I think right now, to have the future, we need to create the future. So what is creating the future? I think it's our teachers. Teachers are like the most important part of civilization because they are teaching 
our future, Absolutely, yeah. which is the kids. Now, how do we get the right kind of teachers to teach what they're supposed to? Not, well, not what they're supposed to, but what they should be teaching. Yeah. Because I have multiple teachers that don't teach me anything. Yeah, yeah. And it's not fair because I want to be part of the future, not just sit around and be like, okay, Absolutely. that's my life. It's gone. You're preaching to the choir here. You know, but you do have a teacher that you like. There is the teacher out there that has understood you and has helped you. And that's the teacher you're going to remember for the rest of your life. That may not be the same teacher another student has. So, in a sense, your struggle is absolutely excellent. Your resentment is totally supportable. And you need to become a teacher. <laughs> or, or you need... Yeah, but it, the problem is not making the future. The problem is making the present work. That leads to the future. And teachers are absolutely essential there. And believe me, teachers are in pain when they cannot connect to a student. The good teachers are in pain most of their careers, one way or another. It's like being a doctor. You can't save them all. You can't convert them all. But the one student that you kept going with who broke through and did something is who you remember as a teacher. So work with your good teachers. And don't, don't, don't get too angry at the teachers who aren't helping you. Because you're a real challenge. You're the barbarian in the classroom, you know? <laughs> cool. How cool is that? Yeah. <laughs> And believe me, that's what I was. I got in a lot of trouble. I was a barbarian in the classroom, you know. And, and I, it was nasty because back in 1968 in English classes, you know, a teacher would say, well, how can you tell us that this Bradbury story means this? Because Ray told me. <laughs> what? You're a teenager. You don't know Ray Bradbury. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. You know, yeah, dropping names. Teachers hate that when you drop names. <laughs> right? <laughs> So be a barbarian, absolutely. But then there's going to come a point when you got to, you know, also become the Byzantine civilization. So we want to honor the, the time that we have. We have some other folks that want to ask a question. But as, as Greg has said, I'm good. There's a lot of stuff in there. that we are asking of him, but of ourselves. That this is ultimately a conversation of, I, I would, by the way, you're welcome to come back anytime. But we would love to have Greg be here for all of you. These are ultimately the questions we have to ask ourselves and answer them. That is why we're here. And I'm going to put across what you said. It is the conversations around the tables that ultimately, a thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, that's the same. But how do we deal with that? With how do we support each other? So I want to make sure we get the final three questions that we have. Get them asked. Because the asking is the critical part. But we also have time to talk. And if you want to speak to the exit slip, over. Sure. The exit slip is we're going to put those on your tables and it just says, you know, what did you take away from this conversation, this discussion with Greg? And then what do you want to know more about? And if you would, if you want to fill one out, that helps us because it's like, what does our community need? So, John, if you want to ask a question, and then Kyle and Robert will get the questions out. We can, we can run over a little bit. This is a good group. We can run over if we... And, and I, I am also fine with running over, but those of you that have a commitment that you need to be elsewhere, please understand that we're not going to stop talking to the time right now, but you may have some place you need to be, and that is not disrespectful. So, and so let's go ahead and do that. Or those of us who are about to be committed and need to meet our keepers, you know. So. <laughs> and, and if you, you have to leave, we, we have a white uh, sign-up sheet, and that sign-up sheet is just so we know who is here, how many people were here, and the yellow one next to it is if you're a committee member, uh, there, you know, we're doing a clock hour thing, and so if you're a teacher and want to do that, I just want to, if you have to leave, just make sure that you, you sign up. So that's our housekeeping thing. So, sir? So, uh, my question is actually to the students over there. And, um, yeah, all over, yeah. All over, even the barbarians. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the barbarians.
Your blank checkbook. Explain your answer. Yeah. physical learner. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to be able to go and hit something. That's one way you'd learn things. math is if you're doing engineering. So. <laughs> Trying to build your own engine. Absolutely. But I, I would just make it more interesting. Have uh, or give students the ability to take the direction they want to go instead of being forced to take classes that they have no interest in. So Astrid and I were asking this of ourselves. When we were in school in California back in the 60s, they had shop classes everywhere. How often are shop classes carried on today in, in Washington? Do you have a lot of shop classes? Wood shop, metal shop, car shop? We don't have a lot of shop in high school, but we do have wood shop in office. Okay. Okay. So that's, I think that's kind of, you're, 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 the problem that a lot of teachers have is that becomes a vocational school, which is not part of the culture of teaching that we've been raised with since John Dewey's days, which is to give you a well-rounded upbringing, not necessarily what you want, but to give you access to many different inputs. So yes, you are frustrated in the classroom, but later on you may know where to find that stuff when you need it. And that's, that's a real problem in teaching is you, you aren't, we aren't here to entertain or to amuse. We are here to challenge and to empower. And that's always a tough thing to do. But I, I quite agree. The physical learners are really important. And they're a different sort of thing. It's almost, I won't go off into the Montessori thing. But physical learning is how many, many people get enthusiastic about carrying on. And, and building up that energy to move on seems to me to be. I, I know that I was kicked out of math as a math. I was a math genius in high school, rated at that level. The math courses irritated me so much that I broke away from, and I've never recovered. So now I write about mathematicians in my fiction, and that's kind of the level I'm at. I can, I can make up the language, but I can't do the math. And that's, that's not very empowering, is it? So how do we improve those things? Math, math is like English. Quite often it comes at you. English is a foreign language for most of us. Certainly the kind of English spoken in English classes is. Math is a foreign language. Instead, it's taught to us as, this is logic. If you don't get it, you are dumb. No, it's a foreign language. You know, most great mathematicians acknowledge that. In fact, uh, Richard Feynman made up his own mathematics when he didn't have access to all the stuff that he needed. He made up his own nomenclature and, and eventually learned how to, to normalize that against the regular math nomenclature and so on. So yeah, we need to give a little more awareness of how humans actually do learn and how you can make them enthusiastic, not by imposition, not by teaching canon, but by empowering. 
That's a tough question for education. You have the microphones. You can say anything you want to. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a question that kind of pertains to uh, the future. As a society, we always strive for growth. And on a limited resource, I've always wondered why. Why do we always strive for growth when we know it's not sustainable? Yeah, yeah. Um, a, a lot of people like to have sex and have kids. <laughs> And those who don't start losing their tax credits. <laughs> the society that doesn't replace itself four times over is considered a declining society. Economically, based on our current model, it's a declining society. So there's all of these, you can find them on the internet, but there's all these hidden incentives to have sex and have kids. Okay? And that is an interesting proposition because we're never going to free ourselves of overpopulation on that basis. So it's, it, that's a major question. I'm not sure I have the answer to it. Um, you have a bunch of really cute babies running around and a bunch of old guys. I mean, come on. I don't know. I'd much rather have kids than that's old. Yeah, kids, are, kids are, are, are wonderful. 20 of them in a house. It's like a classroom, right? So, but the old farm communities had to do that. You had to have a lot of kids because you had large numbers of kids dying. So nowadays, the model is most of your kids live, and that's good. Um, but it's, it's also a problem for the world as a whole. So most of the major societies are engaging in a kind of social version of birth control, which is reducing their population growth to some extent. And then you have more old people and the economic problems involved. In the fact, you're going to have to work twice as hard just to keep us you know, in medical care. <laughs> and if you're willing to put up with that, that's fine. But Nothing is ever simple. As the world is getting you know, tighter and tighter and more connected, people want to get away from all of this. And the pioneering spirit is really strong. So we got people who want to go to Mars. That's a long slog. We're not going to de deplete our population on Earth by sending them to Mars for a long, long time, tens of thousands of years. And you know, what's going to happen on Earth? Well, in the 1960s, you have all these movies, Soylent Green and everything, about overpopulation, really cool movies. And they played off against the nuclear war movies. So the 60s was back and forth. We're all going to die. There's going to be too many of us. We're all going to die. Too many of us. You know? and, and you know, the marvel in Soylent Green is a stalk of celery. You know? Where did you get that? What is that? It's a love apple. It's a tomato. Yeah. Wonderful stuff. But what is the back and forth in all of this? How do we put up with this, this uh, economic notion that growth is essential? Every corporation has to you know, double its profits every 10 years. That doesn't work. That just doesn't work. So when you reach maturity, a mature corporation, the investors start pulling out and moving off to the young corporations. You know, that's also true in society. You know, when you reach a certain age, I'm not going to say what age it is, people around you start saying, you're not being as innovative as you used to be. Did I say innovative or innovative? Works either way. You know, what, what are you in your society that you can keep on being challenging and challenged? Excellent questions. So I'm not saying that, first of all, there's no class that isn't helpful to students in any way. But I'm saying, um, oh, there's got to be one. <laughs> I'm saying, or I'm asking you your opinion on why don't we teach like subjects for seniors, like currently government, like, yeah, how to exactly. change society and how to like learn how to use society to our advantage. Like why don't we teach that in earlier years? I wish they would. It used to be called home ec and civics class. Uh, I think a lot of resentment came out of civics classes because the teachers teaching their students what was really going on in politics in the world. Parents didn't want their kids knowing that. Politicians didn't want their kids knowing that. So civics classes are really a drain. Uh, have, have, not having civics classes is really a drain on our civic discord now because a lot of people just don't know how all this works. They haven't been educated. I think the baby boomers are the least educated in terms of civics of any population since maybe the 18th century. We need that. But home ec is also important. How do you balance a checkbook? How do you cook a meal? How do you keep your dorm room cleaned up? How do you interact with people? Doing that sort of thing. It's not all upper brain thinking. Social skills are social skills. And we need to teach more of that. Good points. Okay. No. Mm. 
sure. Do you believe that having access to this, I mean, just have speedy access to this, could actually lead to some big move side effects like discontentment? Heads exploded. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, too much information is not a bad thing. It's not knowing what you need to know and not being able to find your way through the flood. And that is a real problem today. And that's what critical thinking is all about, is, is you need to know where not to go to get information. You need to know what not to listen to and who not to listen to. It may not be the same for all people. But you cut your own path through, and if the teaching system works for you, it teaches you how to blaze that trail through the infinite landscape of information. And believe me, information has been totally unavailable to most of the uh, educated people of the world. Um, not, you haven't been able to understand all the information coming out since the 18th century. You know, back then you could be a polymath. You could be the universal educated person, the philosopher king. You could understand nearly all that was going on in science. You could be corresponding with most of the scientists on Earth. In Voltaire's day, he could kind of do that. Since the 1820s, that hasn't been possible. And now you can't keep up with the science, can't keep up with the literature, you can't keep up with anything. So you've got to find your own trail. And the really good trailblazer doesn't just wander over the desert. They know where to find the, the hot springs, the wells, the oil wells, all that sort of stuff. How you teach that is the continuing problem. So one of the things we're asking ourselves is, is what do we take away from this as we move forward? Um, the question that was asked earlier uh, about cities and barbarians, I'm trying to come up with, so what do I take away? And this is what we need you to think about as well for yourself. What do we take away? How do we, how do we get the conversation over? Um, for me, Snohomish, the future, 10, 20 years from now, the future is a city where the barbarians are the people who live right now. And in that city, the barbarians will know everything the people in the city don't want them to know, or at least have access to it. And the city wants to control that and tell you what they should and shouldn't know, but the barbarians, they don't give a damn about that. If they're going to move forward into that and do that anyway, how do we live in that world without being Rome or Babylon? Or maybe we just enjoy those final 20 years and just, you know, ride it out with uh, big cities and big buildings and lots of music and dance rooms. I don't know, but what else are you hearing? What are some thoughts that you have? What are some closures? Do you have other questions you want to ask? Are there questions, Greg, that you want to ask of us? Yeah, I, I think I've always very much enjoyed Snohomish as a community. It's just fun to go here. Right. How do you keep that up at the same time that you're marching into the middle of the 21st century? How do you keep that country ethic, the antiques, the ice cream, the tourist stuff, and yet be the high-tech community that we all come to appreciate as a bedroom community for everybody? You know, how do you do all of that and maintain your character? Because we need to see Snohomish change to where it's like Redmond. You know, where all that's been lost, all the farm fields are plowed over and all the farm to market stuff is gone. Um, I think that that's a pretty great strength in your community. So I like the conservative side of the community in terms of keeping what is beautiful about Snohomish at the same time that you're flexible in the future. So how would you do that? Is this the future of the great graduate of the world competition? I think, I think downtown Snohomish County is definitely kind of a Bradbury town, yeah. Okay, I finished that day. Tim's not asking it, and you got the Halo book up there, gaming. What is gaming in education? What is gaming doing to us? What, is, what can we use it for? I'd just like to hear your thoughts. You, you help with uh, the yeah, I've never actually been that much of a game player because I'm more of a you know book kind of guy. But I've I've dipped in on I love Mist. I love touring through Mist and so on. That shows how old I am. Um, Working with Halo, you're dealing with action-adventure games that take you completely outside your ordinary everyday life and give you 3D critical skills that fighter pilots need. Most of us aren't going to grow up to be fighter pilots, especially if we wear glasses. So gaming is a fantasy life. It's also a social interaction where people get together and learn about how rude communities can be and how great they can be around the world. So gamers can play with someone in Hyderabad or 
or uh, Beijing or, you know, depending on where the network goes. And that's kind of fun. You, it, it, the whole notion of a, of a gaming universe leads to this notion of virtual reality, which we've been trying to mess with for the last 30 years, which I find rather boring. But still people find it exciting, you know, certainly things like the Matrix get us going. Um, gaming is about the individual being empowered with sufficient weaponry and skill sets and help from others to accomplish tremendous things in an extraordinarily difficult world. Zombies, for example. You know, we're all surrounded by zombies. The reason zombies are so popular today is everyone's a zombie but us. So it's a fantasy life. It's like being a gangster. You know, a gangster can take vengeance against anyone who disses them in any way. So we watch The Sopranos. How cool is that? That'd be a way to run a high school, I tell you. you know? and, and all of this, and it, you know, it doesn't so much influence our society and impinge upon our psychology as it does release those demons, those passions. But how much gaming can be used to educate in schools creating games involves huge math skills, involves tremendous artistic skills, involves voice acting, involves the drama department, involves everything. And right now there are technical universities like uh, Savannah College of Arts and Design and Academy of Art University and so on that really are teaching those skills to make movies today. And you have to be a mathematician. I visited with a special effects artist, a guy named Kevin Mack recently and his wife, and they're both artists. And he's a mathematical whiz because he has to understand the software that makes the images he's working with. So, you know, out of mathematics comes the visuals of something like uh, incredibly loud or, or, or um, impossibly near and incredibly loud. What's, what's the incredibly close and extremely loud and incredibly close? He did the effects on that or he did what dreams may come. You know, all that stuff involves all of the skill sets that you should find in any ordinary high school. So why not create your own video games? Why not become a school that integrates the mathematics, the, uh, the, the computer skills, the 3D imagery stuff, doing all of this, teaching you how to use uh, Maya and Photoshop and editing software and high-powered computers, which nowadays you don't need to spend a million dollars to get a high-powered computer. Your Apple is what they're using in the workstations and render farms um, in motion pictures nowadays. So yeah, that's what video games can do for a high school. Why not have a competition where the high school creates its own video game? You might have some teacher and, and parent problems. We were at Oklahoma University where they create a race car every year. And that's carbon fiber, it's uh, you know, outsourcing materials, it's doing your own metal shop, it's creating your own engine, it's creating your own batteries. Wow. My perfect high school would be a place that creates its own sports car every year, its own private jet every year, its own video game, and its own $150 million motion picture every year. And your graduation is, you know, the premiere or the Oscar ceremonies. Yeah. Well, given all this and what the students said, uh, they, they mentioned that, that the not certain topics that they're interested in tells me that pretty much every aspect of, uh, of the human life has been industrialized, yeah. except learning. We started at the very beginning. You know, standard bricks, what is one plus one? That is essentially any learning back to the time, beginning of time, to start it off. Um, we don't pump our own water anymore. We don't have to build cars because someone else who's very good does it very audibly. In learning, you still are at the very, very beginning of this. There's no automation tool that allows us to say, we can plug you into something. It's going to train you while you're sleeping to, let's say, fifth grade. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, philosophy or, or writing. This is, this is very much a creative process, but the basic stuff. You know, what, what do we know about the world? You know, what is math? If, if it were possible to take the boring stuff, which is industrialization, all of it, the boring, mundane stuff of everybody's life, not only the kids, but also the teachers would have a lot more time to focus on building race cars, making computer games, stuff that is very engaging. Um, I think it would be tremendously helpful to get this more time in people's hands and they would, they would experience learning a lot better because you know, the learning starts. 
That's a fascinating prospect. I, I, I come up with a half a dozen stories and movies and so on that have touched on this. I don't know if you remember THX 1138, where Donald Pleasance is sitting there and saying, well, when I was a boy, uh, integral calculus was a pill that big, he says. <laughs> you know? And now, it's just, you know, it's, it's, that's progress in his world. Um, the problem here is a physiological problem, which is learning is a creative experience. When students arrive, they are uncooked eggs. Education and learning is cooking you. Literally, it is, in a way, it is fixing your brain to be acceptable to society, to be useful to society. You are getting cooked. You are changing your memory patterns and your neurological patterns so that you instinctively know what to do in a certain situation. It, 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 the instinctive thing is sociological, though. It's not, it's not like you know, a, 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 a moth or whatever doing something. Um, and so that's hard to build into a pill because physical learning is a major part of the whole process. You, your body is part of your brain. It's a huge part of your brain. We need to educate our immune systems the same way because they need to be prepared to live in the real world. And in some respects, the urbanization of the immune system has led to asthma and allergies because we're protecting our kids from this. If we take away the physical processes of acquiring this information on your own and feeling proud of accomplishing it, you get in the science fiction future where this is, you know, this is kind of everything is in a pill form, you get the science fiction future where you don't feel that you ever accomplished anything because it was given to you. You don't have those moments of bright insight where you figured something out the teacher didn't tell you. But we have this large person so far alive already, right? So saying we don't want this in learning because it would spoil our personality, uh, that is closing the eyes to we don't grow up in a cave anymore, right? Because we live in a house, because the environment is given to us by our parents. Absolutely. Um, we don't get all the, the viral infections anymore because we localized it at birth, so, so stuff doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, since the brain is, is, as you said, a very, very complex part, and we're just now starting to understand how it works, um, I'm carefully hopeful that, that further down the line, the future we're talking about, uh, possibilities might arise to have basic fundamental learning imprinted in you, uh, because that is what, what I think lots of, of I mean, yeah, this word called your government, dumb students struggle with. They, I imagine, have a hard problem, motivate themselves to get through the stuff that they're not interested in. Right. which denies them access to the stuff that they might get interested in if they would just come up with this song. Agreed, not everybody, but, but I imagine there's a bunch of kids that, that are either too smart and they get bored, therefore, like with your math, you, you never got to this part where you said, you know, you, you can do the math, you can understand it, but you, you get bored at this point of, I don't want to put in all this legwork, which denies you access to the part that you might have gotten interested in. Right. Algebra sucks. Tensor theory is interesting. <laughs> it's not a good model, though, you know. Uh, it, all excellent questions. And this is this whole educational philosophy thing, which I'm sure the teachers have gone through. You know, are we there to expose the kids to things they don't want to know simply because we want a well-rounded body politic? That's going to involve butting heads. Um, are we there to empower them in their careers? As, are we only vocational teachers? If so, how do we do that? And how do we guarantee a universal access and excellence so that they will fit into their future jobs perfectly? You know, that's part of this whole philosophy where, where education is changing so rapidly now and has been for the last 40, 50 years. Do we have vocational high schools? Yes. Are they places where, where students become less liberal arts or coordinated and more engineering and, and business coordinated? Yes. Does that create a body politic we want to live with? I don't know. But the whole liberal arts notion is that the kid is always better off if they're exposed to more things and more inputs. And you can't feed that to them in a pill form because what if it reacts badly? What if you're allergic to algebra? <laughs> what if having that in your brain gives you the hives, you know? What, and we don't know the back and forth on this. The fact is, a lot of education is, let's try this out on this poor schmuck, this poor student of ours. See if they like it or not. If they don't, that's only a year. They'll be miserable for a year. That's life. If they do, it'll change their lives. We, can't, you know, we really don't know, and they don't know either. 
If we could tune in on the perfect psychology of every individual we're teaching, that's an amazing prospect with many dark sides to it. Because if you understand how they learn, you can amend how they learn. You can stop them from learning things that are dangerous to your society. The more unhappy people there are in a society, the healthier the society is up to a point. If the unhappiness leads to more opportunities, more pathways, that is better. If the unhappiness leads to I am not being allowed to be who I am, that's not good. And that's always the problem in education is I have no way to solve that. But it is an interesting prospect. What if you could get through, uh, I don't know, basic economics, home ec, by spending a half an hour each day hooked up to something? So you're a really good cook at the end of that. And you know how to balance your checkbook. Suddenly you're a practical person. And do you become an artist or do you become a chef? Is there any difference? I don't know. In the last few minutes before we offer folks a conclusion here, and the conclusion is you, you have an exercise. You, you've written down things that you've heard. And if you're intimidated or you have a question about, you know, can I share this, can I say this, you, you, you've already come up with the idea. What have you heard? What are the things you want us to take away in the last closing is that really should be your goals. When I was looking at this up here, I was just kind of cruising through People say that we have to be careful in moving into the future to not forget our past and our basics. Two people talk about the front porch and the need for those interpersonal communication to, to still be paramount in whatever future it is. What are some of yours? Please. You, yeah. Um, the thing that really strikes me is the idea that
Thank you guys for having us, and I'll end this on the note of when I gave a talk at the FBI Academy, uh, which was a very judgmental place, <laughs> really full of you know, high-powered agents approaching middle age, and, and, uh, and so I gave a talk, and one of the agents walked up to me afterwards, and he says, as we're getting ready for our group photo, he says, you know, I know what you had for breakfast this morning. And I look back, flakes, and he goes, you got it. You are what you eat, he says. <laughs> So I want you to take that away here as, uh, you know, the, the, I, I get as much out of this as you guys do, if not more. You'll all become characters in novels soon, so. <laughs>